It only shows that Linda joined. It only shows that Linda joined. It doesn't show that anybody else joined. But I don't know, it could be that other people tried. Hi, Alad. Hi, Linda. Sorry, you tried earlier, I know. Sorry. Can you um, unmute? It's because I don't remember what times. <laughs> no, no, it was supposed to be 6.30, but I had a, a hiccup here. Oh, okay. I just got on, I just got on now, so. Okay. I, well, uh, I didn't know if it was 6.30 or 7, so I figured I'd just yeah, try. Yeah, all more. right, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah. But you were the only one who came on earlier. Elad, how are you? I'll give it a couple of minutes. Rob, I love it. Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Um, yes. Okay, so we are on. Okay, thank you. Besides, there's someone else here. No, okay, hi. <laughs> I'm just trying to get hold of a couple of the people who are usually here. Just a moment. I think people, um, well, I was late, but I think with Hanukkah also, I didn't see any notices that anyone was on except for Linda. And um, uh, um, and usually we get notice beforehand, but there was no notice, you know, like what wasn't. time or anything. Oh, that's weird. I tried making a, a, a list for myself of uh, the, the the numbers and the passwords and the times, but. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to quickly send the, um, I'm going to quickly send the, whatchamacallit. Yeah. Just a second. Send the invitation. Okay, I just sent the Zoom link. Yeah, I got it. Also, was the um, the this thing being sent? Was this supposed to be sent out again? Which thing? The mimer. Did you get the English? Uh, I got it. Some. Did you get it this week? No, I, no. I got it from before, I believe. Okay, just a second. So nobody got it this week? There's something going on with our communication, a problem. Yeah. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think so. You know, um, I do okay, have a tendency to- let me just ask to, her. Yeah. And this is- uh, um, Meets vote. 
near Hanukkah. I think this is the one. I don't know. Oops. Well, English and Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. This is about the bulls and the. Right. This is. I got this, I don't know when. I don't know where I found it either. Somewhere. Okay, that's good. Got that. Okay, this. I need to get more notebooks. Oh, she said she sent it out at three. Today? She said that. Yeah, on, on what? On uh, um, regular email? Uh -huh. Or, I don't know where it is. So here we, okay, so here's for, for Hasidus. Join the cloud meeting, that's from you. Uh, last thing I have is Rebbe's, wait, three unread messages. No, I have Rebbe's wisdom for Friday. Before that, it's next level Torah. All right, oh, let's, yeah. never mind. Let's, let's yeah. talk. Okay, uh, if you didn't get it, I'll make sure you get, get, it goes out now. So let's discuss the Mimer. I wanted to hear from you. Um, we can review the Mimer, but I wanted to hear from you. The points that that um, that were most meaningful to you, what you got from the mimer, some questions, some comments on the mimer, if you would please um, share with me. I know that for me, um, there was a, a tremendous amount of insight, things I never knew before, nor did I understand before. Um, especially some of the Kabbalah that's involved, uh, you know, learning about oil and, and its significance beyond the fact that it was just the one that was saved in the temple. I still don't understand the bowls. That doesn't, I don't understand the bowls at all, but <laughs> I don't know why it's not connecting for me. Um, and, uh, and the thing that was interesting too is that it's a very interesting sneaky way that the Greeks tried to overcome us, uh, not by coming in and, and, and killing everybody, but by, and not even spilling the, just defiling the oil. I mean, I don't know how they would have known that just removing the tops would have defiled the oil. Um, remember that there were Heimer, remember that there were many, many, many Hellenistic Jews. Jews, Hellenistic right. Jews, and they understood the halacha. Yeah. They understood. By the way, she says that she sent it by email. The Mimer. Oh, okay. I'll look. Okay. So <clears throat> it would. All of that was interesting. And. And certainly, you know, what they did was uh, uh, and not unintelligent. It was sneaky. You know, they knew that there were Hellenistic Jews and they figured, so we could still study the Torah, but, you know. That was the, right, that was the insidiousness. That was the danger. Yeah. yeah. Because, because it's like you have the body of the Torah that was fine. Right. Even the understanding of Torah was fine. It right. was the it was the the special connection. Right. So and and that's even harder when you have someone. You know, it's interesting that when you have someone 
who opposes and says, this is bad, this is wrong, it's one mm -hmm. thing. Right. But then when you have someone who says, oh, I'm with you, and I agree with you, it's just, you know, this little change. This was the, mm -hmm. this was the fight also, same kind of fight in, um, in, in Russia when the Enlightenment movement so-called started. Mm -hmm. So they, they didn't, you know, Moses Mendelssohn who started the, the um, Enlightenment movement was a religious Jew. Mm -hmm. He was observant, kept Torah, kept, uh, kept Shabbos and everything. He just wanted to change a little bit about the educational system, you know, let's take out, let, let's, let's, let's uh, modernize it a little bit. Let's take away that, that special, unique, or whatever. Yeah. So that's the, that's the, that, that, that is what leads to, ultimately what leads to assimilation and loss. And that's what happened with the Greeks. You know, that they, 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 the whole country was pretty much, many, many Jews in the country were going along with that. Yeah. And um, this was a huge, yeah, this was a huge deal. Because it was, you know, because it was, uh, whoops, there goes my, there go my candles. Because it was chipping away. It wasn't this blatant, you know, in your face thing. It was chipping away, chipping away. So people really didn't, probably didn't realize it because it was such a small chip away. You know, thinking that, well, if the rabbi is going to do this little change, it's probably good. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And that's, that's more dangerous than anything else, I think. You see, people ask, I said, you see, and Siri opened up. Uh, people ask, why, why are we so rigid? Orthodox Judaism is so rigid. I don't think so. It's not rigidity. It's not rigidity. It's actually just sticking to, because recognizing there's a line. It's either from Hashem or it's not from Hashem. If it's from Hashem, it's from Hashem. As soon as you stray from, and you move away from the line that it's not Hashem anymore, mm -hmm. at that point, you know, and it's not a question of, is it, you know, truth is truth. Emet, the word, for the Hebrew word, for truth is emet, aleph, mem, taf. Aleph is the first letter of the aleph bait, taf is the last letter of the aleph bait, and mem is the middle letter of the aleph bait. Mm -hmm. Truth has to, is truth. If it's not, if it's partially true, then it's not true anymore. Yeah. That's the thing about truth. It's very straightforward. Okay. And one of the things I actually, I mean, one of the things I've learned is that orthodoxy, at least uh, through, through uh, Chabad, is not rigid at all. So I wish more people could understand this. <laughs> okay. Anything else that uh, anyone would like to share? Marina, were you there part, part of the class or un unmute? Yeah, so I was gonna comment. I, I don't think I came to the class um, and I, I think I was a little late to this one to know which one it was. Was this one the one yesterday? No, this is the mime we've been doing for the past four, four or five weeks. Okay, so I joined we, a couple of classes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm asking for uh, comments, reactions, what part of the mimer spoke to you, you know, what it means to you, and what you learned from it, etc. We decided today, instead of starting a new uh, mimer, we decided to recap today, and then and then next week we're going to move on to a new mimer for um, for. Uh, a new mimer for uh, for Yud Shvat. Yes. Basi Lagani. Yeah, that's it, next week. But this week it, we're doing this. Okay, and um, I'm, I want to make sure that I have the readings for it. <laughs> not being delinquent, um, and I I'm not sure if I do. Okay, uh, this is the mimer about about why is it? We'll talk about the bulls, uh, yeah. Betty. I'll, I mean, uh, Linda. I'll go through that a little bit more. Um, we asked about why the menorah is lit in the at night and not in the daytime when the like the menorah in the temple was. Why we light eight lights, not seven. Mm -hmm. And we also like what's the asked what's the connection between the lighting of the menorah and the bulls of Sukkot. The reason that Shammai says Beit Shammai says that we start with eight and go down, eight the first night, seven the second night, candles, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Is because it's similar to the bulls 
that were offered on um, that were offered on uh, Sukkot in the temple. So the question we ask is, what's the connection with it, with with the offering of the of the temple, and what's the connection of Sukkot? And what's the connection with the bull? That's that. Those are the three major questions that we have. Eli, do you want to share anything with us? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted still. If you're on a if you're on a desktop, you can just press the uh, hold down the. Oh, there we go. Right. There we go. No, I appreciate the opportunity to say anything, but there is nothing to say. So. Okay. Fine. But let me continue. Yeah. Fine. Andrea, you want to share something? Um. No. Um. Thank you, Rabbi. I've been um missing quite a bit lately in the past three or four weeks and so i'm just trying to catch up okay uh, so I'll, I'll review a little bit marina did you want to say something i did i have a question and maybe it's not necessarily related specifically to the mimer because i think um, the mimer is more focused on halacha but um i did recently uh, listen to um a talk by jonathan Sachs, and in it he he mentions um even that there was a debate, you know, after, after, um, you know, after Hanukkah happened, and after you know some time with uh, with the observance of it, there was there was a rabbinic debate as to whether or not Jews should even have Hanukkah um, as a holiday. And so I, I did. I, it was super recent. I it was very new, um, and I don't, I don't know. I don't want to take the, this into another direction, but I. Um, that that intrigued me um, as something that I would love you know to. What the source, do you know what the source for that is? No, the no. Says no. That the, next year, the Talmud says that the next year they establish the holiday of Hanukkah and to light the candles and everything. And I, I, you know what? I haven't seen it or I haven't heard it as never a proof. Okay. But I haven't seen it or heard it. I would love to know what the source of that is. Okay. I do but, know, I yeah. do know that we had a family in our house and their 13 year old daughter, it was, it was, it was Friday night and we had a fr Friday night dinner and we had, you know, celebrated Hanukkah, we lit the Hanukkah lights and people were here and it was very nice. And then we was talking about, I was talking about the miracle of the candles and the 13 year old blurts out and says, oh, the miracle of the oil is a myth. And I said, where did you learn that? And she said, oh, in her school, it's a Jewish school that she attended. And her teacher in her school, her Judaic studies teacher in her school, told her that it was a myth. Um, that's exactly what Hanukkah comes to fight. Exactly yeah. that attitude, right? <laughs> that what I teach, what our sages have taught us, is a myth. It's it's uh, anyway. I, you know what? I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know the the answer to what, where the source is. But I'd love to if you can find a source. That would be great. Okay, that's that's all that's all I needed to know. I I that was very 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 surprising to me, very new, and so sort of at the crux. So if I was going to comment on something, that would be it. <laughs> Otherwise, I I need to read up a little bit more on the Mimer. So I'll do all my right, home. So let's review let's review the main points of the Mimer. I just want to give Alex that just joined us. I want to give him a chance if he wants to say anything. He's just connecting. Do you see him? You do? Yeah. He says he's connecting to audio. He's not connected yet. All right. Let me start. And then when Alex, if you can hear me when you get on, uh, you need to connect your audio. When you get on, you'll be, I'll be I'm happy to hear from you. All right. The, the, the point of the mimer is that the light of the menorah is a unique light. It's a light that comes from an extremely high source, higher than anything that was revealed before. And it's a light, therefore, that penetrates darkness in a way that no other light is able to penetrate darkness. Hi, Alex, did you want to share something with us? No, I basically, you know, I haven't received any email, so I almost missed the meeting. I had to copy and to send it from Facebook. Oh, the, what, the link you're talking about? Right, invitation for the Zoom meeting. Yeah, you know what, it's the same. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why that happened. I'm really sorry. But I do have to tell you that the uh, the, the link is the same every week. 
Uh-huh. Okay. And I just sent I sent it out late. I got on actually late myself and I sent it out by uh whatchamacallit just before. All right, you're on twice right now, so we see your face twice, once real and once virtual. Oh, I can I can actually delete the other one if you like. Okay, you're gone. Okay, you're here only once now. All right. Okay. So the light of Hanukkah is this intense light. It's a spiritual light that comes from a place that is extremely high. Now, there is a verse that says, Ki ata neri Hashem, for you are my candle Hashem, va Hashem yagia chashki, and Hashem touches or reaches my darkness, transforms my darkness. So, and Hasidus explains, first of all, the sages say that this is referring to Hanukkah, that the light of Hashem transforms the darkness, as we see in Hanukkah, that we light the menorah outdoors. Um, we don't today because, uh, you know, we live among non-Jews, but um, in the times of the temple, they would light outdoors, and in Israel today, many people light outdoors. The idea is to be right in front of, just outside the front door, an idea is to illuminate the darkness, transform the darkness. So it says, Va Hashem Yagia Chashki. And the sages say that refers to Hanukkah. And Hashem will transform my darkness. Va Hashem. The word Hashem is Yudke Vavke, is the name of God that is above nature. But still, it's, it's connected to nature. Va Hashem and Hashem refers to that which is even above the name of Yudke Vavke which means the essence of Hashem that is above nature, creation. So we said that there are three levels. There's that which is within us, the light of Hashem that is within us. Then there's the light of Hashem that surrounds us, but is connected to us. And then there's the essence which is above all of that. Like we talked about the difference between when you eat, the food goes inside. When you have clothes, the clothes surround you, but they're close to you and they are according to your measurements. And then you have the house, which is also surrounds, but it's far away from us, and it's not related directly to the person at all. You don't know, but looking at the house, who's inside the house. You get an idea of the people who own the house, are wealthy or not, but you don't know who's in the house because, after all, uh, anyone could be in the house. When you, when you look at clothes, you can tell uh, more or less the person's size, shape, etc. So these are the three levels we talked about intellectual understanding of Torah, that which comes within us like food, that we think about, we understand, that we should serve Hashem. Then the next level is that, um, that there is beyond understanding, that we should serve Hashem beyond understanding. But it makes sense that we should serve Hashem beyond understanding. It is our minds that lead us to understanding that we should serve Hashem, even that which we don't understand. So it's still connected to, to understanding. Because if I think about it, I realize Hashem is my creator. Hashem put me here. Connecting to Hashem is very important. Hashem told me to do this. Obviously, I should do it even if I don't understand it. But that's logical still. And then there's the connection to Hashem that is the essential bond with God. That bond is, is it's not that I think about it and therefore I connect with Hashem. It's the essential bond of a Jew, the essential inner part of a Jew, the yechida, the essence of the soul that can never be separated from God because that's its essence. No matter what a person does, no matter where a person goes in life, the yechida is always there. The yechida is always unique, is always with Hashem, the yechida. And yechida is, is one, where there is yechida, there's no negativity. Yechida, what, below yechida, there's a possibility of negativity, of darkness, light and dark. But when it comes to Yechida, there's no possibility of darkness. So it's, it's the singular, singular thing that there's no possibility of darkness. So now we're going to translate that to, to the, what, the, what the Greeks... The Greeks defiled the temple, representing the temple represents Bina, the understanding of Torah. So they went and they wanted the Jewish people to, to, uh, to not observe Torah 
but they didn't start with that. They started out with defiling the oil. What is oil? Oil, we said, floats above other liquids. So oil represents that which is beyond logic. They defiled the oils in the temple. In other words, they went after not just the, not just the temple itself, not just the understanding, but the purity of the understanding. They defiled the oils, the, 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 that which goes beyond logic. Because their goal was, they said to the Jews, you know what, you want to learn Torah? Fine, but not Hashem's Torah. So in terms of logic, don't think of it as Hashem's Torah. If you're learning Torah, learn Torah, but think of it as something, just some, some kind of wisdom, not God's wisdom. So that's defiling the temple. Then they went beyond that. They wanted us to completely break our connection even when it comes to mitzvahs or doing anything. They wanted, they said that they, that they wanted us to break our connection to Hashem, even that which is beyond logic. And they defiled that. So they were able to defile the lower two levels, and that's why they were able to break the seals on the, on the, on the oil, and they were able to stop the burning of the menorah. But there's something they could never touch, and that's the yechida. The yechida the Greeks couldn't touch because the essence of a Jew can never be touched by anything. And that is represented by the one bottle of oil that was sealed with the seal of the Kohen Gadol of the high priest. The seal of the high priest, that is the Holy of Holies, the high priest represents the Holy of Holies, the high priest represents that which is the essence, the Yechida. And that's why, by the way, I added this and I, I've seen it elsewhere, that um, they found one bottle of oil. Why couldn't they, a miracle happen, they could find eight bottles of oil with the high priest's signature? The answer is because that was a singular thing. The Yechida is one. It's where there is only one, where there is no good and bad, where there is only good, where there is only Hashem. On that level, they couldn't defile. That's why we light eight candles instead of seven, because eight represents above nature. Seven is nature, eight represents above. And that's why we light it at night, because it's only the menorah of, of Hanukkah, that light that comes from the essence, from the Mesir Nefesh, from the revelation of the essence of the soul. Because if you think about it, logically, the, the, the Maccabees, the Asmaneans, had no, no chance at all to win this. It's not even a war. They're like a little fly, swat a little a, a mosquito. What, what was there? One family of Koenim and a couple of people joined them against tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of Greek soldiers with elephants and with, with battering rams and with who knows what they had. This huge army. Imagine. If, 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 they, they tell a joke that uh, uh, Mao Zedong, that was his name, right? The, 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 the Chinese dictator, right? Mao Zedong um, hears, he's told that Israel is coming to war against China. So he says, who is, what is Israel? So they said, Israel is a nation of two and a half million Jews. He said, oh, really, which motel are they staying in? <laughs> then they went and told uh, Golda Meir that China is going to war against Israel. She said, what's China? They said, it's a nation of a billion people. She said, really, where are we going to bury them all? Anyway, that's the joke. But compared to the Syrian a Greek army, the Jewish people, these, these people were a, a little fly on the wall. It was totally illogical, but you know what? It wasn't about logic. It was about the essence of the soul, Masirat Nefesh. They were willing to sacrifice everything for the purity of Torah. And therefore, Hashem brought this huge miracle, which completely broke nature, beyond logic, beyond nature, beyond everything. And they won the war. And not only did they win the war, they found that bottle of pure oil. That itself was a miracle, because they could have lit the, the oil with impure, the, the manure with impure oil, if it didn't have any pure oil. But Hashem made a miracle for them. They found that purity. That purity was not touched because that purity could not be touched. That's the point. That level could not be touched. And that's why the menorah is lit at night because only the menorah can, of Hanukkah can transform the darkness. Because when it's really dark, the darkness can only be transformed by a light that is connected to Yechida. Because the regular darkness, regular light cannot transform this kind of darkness. As we see, when the Greeks came, 
the menorah, which is the regular light that was lit every day, stopped being lit. But the Hanukkah lights were lit, even the darkest times of exile, the Hanukkah lights have always been lit and they'll never stop because of that special quality. What's the connection with the, with the bulls? The idea is that on Sukkot, during the seven days of Sukkot, we are connecting with the essence of Hashem that is above, that is above nature. And those 70 bulls represent the idea that we're transforming the entire world. The 70 bulls represent the nations. And that is the idea that on Sukkot, we have the surrounding light of Hashem that transforms the entire world. And on Shemini Atzeret, on the eighth day, that all comes and we gather it in and it connects us so that it affects us. And the same thing on Hanukkah, we're taking that light of Yechida, of beyond nature, and bringing it in to the world in a way that it affects the world. And what the Rebbe concludes the Maimar, that the, the darkest time is the time of the last moments of exile before Mashiach comes. And this is where especially the menorah has its impact. And that's why we should always try to increase mitzvahs, the light of mitzvahs, and especially the light of the Hanukkah lights, we should try and get other people to light the menorah. We should light the menorahs outside, etc., in order to increase the Hanukkah light because that's what's going to completely transform the darkness. Any, um, so any more comments or questions, please? How are you, Eddie and Yael? Oh, is there explanation, or what is the explanation that there are 70 bulls? Seven zero. Because there are 70 nations. So that represents the entire world. 70 nations, there, are, there were originally, the original number of nations was 70 nations. So it has nothing to do with seven Sifirot. Well, it certainly does. All right, I think, yeah. I'm trying. Certainly does, certainly does. And the Jewish people are, were 70 souls, it does have to do with the seven spherot. Um, these are, the way they were translated into the world was mostly impure because most of the nations actually went against the Jewish people throughout history and did not follow the seven Noachide laws and did not support Torah. So it represents impurity, but um, in its source, remember that we learned that the 70 nations in their source come from Tohu. Right, we have the seven kings of Edom. They come from Tohu. So that represents the surrounding light, which is on a higher level. It translates into the world in the negativity, and that's why it goes down. That's why we started from 13 the first day, and then 12 the next day, the bulls, to minimize, to cut, to cut down on the impurity of the world. That's the whole idea of the offering of the 70 bulls, to, to, tra to transform the negativity to positive. And that's ultimately accomplished by the light of the surrounding light that happens. So it's like Hanukkah, the surrounding light of the world, the light that is from the essence of Hashem that is above the world, comes into the world, transforms the darkness. And similarly, the, the, uh, the light of Hashem from above the world comes into the world and minimizes the impurity and the, and the, the negativity of the nations to the extent that we said that the nations are affected by this and the nations, the effect is that they want to protect the temple because what the temple brings them. And even though they didn't know it then, but they will know when Mashiach comes. So this is happening. This transformation is happening. This is a thing that to remember that we don't see it now with our physical eyes, but the transformation of the world is happening. And the fact that the world is so dark right now and there's so much negativity in the world is because of the last moments of the darkness of exile and, and it's fighting that last bit of, of light that has to break through, but the, but the light of Hanukkah, and in our generation, we saw Hanukkah become a major holiday instead of a little minor holiday, because this is, this is the last vestiges of the exile that are being broken through by the light of Hanukkah, the light of mitzvahs in general. Right, and on social networks, I hear happy Hanukkah from different people, not Jewish people as well. I wanna tell you a fascinating thing. I have a very, I have a close friend who's become quite involved um, in Judaism. And he was raised, for whatever reason, he was raised by uh, Native Americans. Not raised, raised literally, but he spent a lot of time with Native Americans 
and became very much part of the Native American culture and uh, recently found his Jewish roots. Started putting on tefillin, started getting involved in Yiddishkeit. And, um, he, he's struggling in a way to recognize, you know, he recognizes the truth of Torah, but he still has his roots there. And, you know, they, um, their, their religion is a, is a religion of idol worship. They worship Mother Earth as, it's maybe a refined kind of idol worship, but no. they, they believe that Mother Earth is everything, all life comes from Mother Earth. When we know that Earth, the Earth gives light because it's God's light. The God, is, God makes things grow through the Earth, as opposed to the Earth being a God. Linda, do you disagree with that? What I was going to, terrible, I can't, my fingers aren't working. No, what I was going to say is that um, uh, uh, you're right, but I think their religion or their philosophy or theology or whatever you want to call it um, really is about nature. Right. Nature is a force. Nature creates. Right. Any, anything that ascribes any power to anything but Hashem is a form of idolatry. Hashem uses nature like a wood chopper uses um, an axe. You don't praise the axe for chopping down the wood. The axe has nothing to do with this. It's simply a tool. And the same thing, all of nature is simply a tool in Hashem's hand. The whole idea of bowing down to idols, the Rambam says, started when people started saying, because God uses nature to bring life to the world. So therefore we have to we have to give respect to nature, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, whatever. And then from there came, we have to bow down to them. So, so it is a form of idolatry. Anyway, so he sent me, he got two, he got two cartoons from two different lists. One was from a Native American list and one was from some other list. So the Native American list, uh, the cartoon goes that Santa shows up uh, at a Native American uh, reservation or something, and they say to him, sorry, you're not part of the tribe, you're not welcome here. And the other one that he got from a completely different place is he opens the door and he sees people with the yarmulkes and a menorah lighting. He says, whoops, I'm sorry, I came to the wrong place. They said, who cares? Come on in before you freeze your tochas off. I'll make you a cup of coffee. <laughs> and he said, the stark difference between the two, that here is a, is a religion that invites people and welcomes people, it doesn't matter who you are, and goodness and kindness. And here's the one where if you're not part of them, you're not, you're not welcome. The interesting difference between them. So I pointed out to him that tzedakah and, I, and that welcoming guests is something which goes back to Avraham Avinu. Abraham and Sarah, they had a tent and they invited everybody in to give them food. These were Arab uh, idol worshippers that they invited into their house into the tent. So uh, anyway, so how did I get onto that? I don't remember. Something about, anyway, so mitzvahs that, uh, you know, this is all, this is all what's bring Mashiach, but there was, I don't remember how I got into that topic. Anyway. A, qu a quick question. How did, um, how did the, 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 the gift thing with Hanukkah come about? You know, people, kids get gifts every day, like one gift a day or something. How did that come about? The purity of our religion doesn't require any of any borrowing from anyone else. Right. That the custom, the Jewish custom for Hanukkah is to give kids Hanukkah geld, to give yeah, kids, yeah. kids money. Yeah. In order to teach them, among other things, kids like to get money. It, it kind of excites them about the holiday, but also to teach them to give tzedakah from the money. So they take a tenth of the money and they give it to Tzedakah at least. Where does gifts come from? I have no idea. Gifts under the menorah, you know, I'm, I was very embarrassed. The first year or two we were here, first couple of years we were here. So we had a Jewish neighbor a few doors away and they had a son. I used to play with my kids. And one Hanukkah, they invited us over for, for Hanukkah. So we, we said we don't eat anything. They specially got for the kids, they got some candies, whatever. So we came over and he had a wrap present for every one of our kids. 
it wasn't, and, and then, you know, I, gave, I don't remember if I gave him Hanukkah Galt or not, and then we left. It dawned on me, probably a few months later, that he was expecting us to give him gifts. It wasn't even part of my, you know, experience of Hanukkah. It's Hanukkah, you give gifts. However, there's not, you know, it's a holiday, so you go visit, you bring a gift, maybe, maybe that's where it comes from. But the idea of giving gifts, our holidays are better because they only get one night and we get eight nights. It's, it's, it makes me sick when I hear it. Sick. It's the exact opposite of what Hanukkah is all about. Hanukkah is all about the purity of Judaism. We're not following anyone else. We're not copying anyone else. Again, you go to visit someone, you bring a gift, fine. But that's not what Hanukkah is about. So just a funny little story. Um, this time of the year, people have uh, Christmas get-togethers. And several years back, they all decided that they were going to bring their own, everybody had to bring their own wine glasses and decorate them. So, OK, so I did. And I made, <laughs> mine was, uh, uh, let's see, it was, um, uh, hold on, I'll get it. <laughs> Okay, so I made this little thing. So as you can see, it's got a Tannenbaum, but on the other side, there's the little rabbi there in a sleigh. And there's the globe on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then it says, and of course there's the, what is that, the reindeer with his uh, tallies, tallet. Anyway, it says on the bottom, Santa Claus, 24,902 miles. And then it says Shlomo Claus, 29,902 miles times eight. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Um, the, uh, another problem I have is the whole idea of building a religion based on lies and fantasies they tell the kids that are not true. What's a kid supposed to think when he grows up or she grows up at age eight or nine or 10 or whatever age they finally realize there's no such thing as Santa Claus? What are they supposed to think? And the Easter bunny and the this and the that. What, what are they supposed to think when they wake up and see it's not true? Are they supposed to think that the rest of the religion is true? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, they tell a story about someone who wanted to have a tree. So he goes to his rabbi, Orthodox rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, is there some kind of bracha I can say to make this tree okay? Rabbi says, tree, tree. Are you kidding? You can't have a tree. So he goes to a different denomination rabbi. And he says to him, Rabbi, is there a bracha I can make on the tree to make it possible? He says, you know, you know, a tree, a bracha, it doesn't really, it's not really appropriate. If you can have a tree, you should make a bracha on it. He goes to the third denomination rabbi. And he says to him, Rabbi, is there any bracha I can make on a tree? He says, what's a bracha? The problem is that this is the way it goes. You know, it starts from little differences, little things, and, and then it ends. And this is, the, this is the fight against assimilation that we have, that we had then and we have today, which is the Jewish identity. People don't even recognize Jewish identity. You know, it, it's, it's interesting that other religions you are part of that religion because of what you believe. In Judaism, you're a Jew because you're a Jew, because that is your, 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 that is your identity. And there are many people today, and it's unfortunate that I hear people telling me, you know, my parents were Jewish. And, and they think the same, they don't recognize, they don't even get it that Judaism is, a, is an identity. That's what we're fighting today. And it's very important for us to get out there. And this is the lesson of Hanukkah, you know, the world is dark, we gotta increase the light. So we've got to, all of us have to do this. Every single one of us has to take this message of Hanukkah and go out into the world and make a difference and teach Jewish people about their Jewish identity. And everybody can do it. Every single Jew can do it. You don't need any special qualifications. You don't have to be a great scholar. Everybody can do it. The Yechida, every Jew has a Yechida. Just touch that Yechida and then you can do it. This is what has to be done today.
Um, did I, I think I told the story last week about the menorah. Did I tell the story about the shamash last week? I don't remember. Maybe I didn't. I wanted to, I wanted to tell a story that I, I don't remember. What I, I know I've told it before, but I don't remember told it in this group. Um, do you remember? Yeah, El, do you remember a story about a shamash? About the question the king asked the rabbi, why, why there's a shamash? Yes, I think you told that story, but... I did tell it last week, right? I did okay, tell it. tell it again, because not all of us remember it so well. Thank you. So I'll tell it briefly. There was a king in a, in an, it was in a, one of the Arab countries, and the king had a very... In those days, the Jews got along with the, with the Muslims. And um, so the Muslim king, he, would, he was a very benevolent king, and he would walk around the neighborhoods and check out his people. And he once was walking, it was Hanukkah, and he saw the Jewish people have, I guess, in the windows or by the doors. He noticed these, these lamps with, uh, with candles burning. So he, he called the, his friend, the rabbi, he had a very close friend, I think it was, it was an advisor of his or his doctor, I don't remember. And the, the rabbi, he asked the rabbi, what's the meaning of the candles? He told him the meaning of the candles. And he said, why is there one candle above all the others? What's the secret of the, sh the candle above all the others? He says, that's the shamash. What's the secret of the shamash? He says, well, the shamash is used to light the others. And also to make sure in case we use the light, that there's another light because we're not allowed to use the light of the candles. And the king said, no, 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 there's got to be a, more of an explanation than that. Uh, give me another explanation. He said, there's no other explanation. He said, you're hiding a secret from me. I'm giving you a few days to come back to me and give me the answer. So this rabbi, the next few days, he was completely, I don't know if it was a rabbi or just one of the leaders in the Jewish community. And he was very, very, Concerned because he didn't have a better answer. He didn't know what to do. He looked through books and everything, couldn't find a better answer. The evening before he had to go to the king, he was very distressed and he was walking out to get some fresh air, going for a walk. And some guy comes by, a bit of a nudnik, and he starts talking to him, starts drinking him a cup, you know, starts, starts nudging him. And he doesn't want to talk, he doesn't want to be involved, but the guy keeps on talking to him. Finally, the guy says to him, What's the secret? Why is the what's the secret of the shamash? Why is the shamash higher than all the others? And when he heard this, he perked up. Remember, I told you last week, and he said, every one of the candles performs a mitzvah. Right? There's there's eight candles for eight nights. Each one is a mitzvah. The shamash has no purpose other than to light the others to serve the others. When somebody is humble and recognizes that his mission is to serve others, then he's high. That, that's what lifts him up. We talked about arrogance and humility. And this is, uh, this is the lesson of the, of the shamash. Um, in general, Hanukkah is known as a time of, of miracles, a time of light, a time to give more tzedakah. It's a mitzvah to give more tzedakah on Hanukkah. It says one should eat a little bit more, but there's no real mitzvah of having a special feast on Hanukkah because the main part of Hanukkah was the, was the spiritual fight and therefore the spiritual remembrance by lighting the menorah, the, the lights represent the spiritual and also by saying praises, halal. We say halal every day, praises to Hashem. And we add the al hanisim prayer when we say the benching after the food and also when we say Shemona Esrei and Amida, this is the main observance of Hanukkah and to study more Torah and to study about Hanukkah and what it means and the Hasidus of Hanukkah, which is what we've done over the past few weeks. Okay, anyone have anything else to add? Let me tell you, otherwise, let me tell you about next week. So beginning next week, Bezrat Hashem, we're going to study the Mimer Basi Lagani. Basi Lagani is the Mimer that the previous Rebbe wrote just before he passed away to be studied on the day that turned out to be the day he passed, passed away. So this is his, like, we consider this a spiritual will. It talks about the purpose of life. It really does. It really talks about the purpose of life. It talks about um, the meaning of, of Jewish life. It talks about transforming the world, the physical to spiritual. Phenomenal mimer. And for, 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 close to, for many, many years after that, Every year, the Rebbe would take one chapter and, trend, and, and explain it at great length. So we're going to do the original one by the previous Rebbe, Rossi Lagani, that is always studied on, 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 on the 10th of Shvat, give you, a, give you a jump on it. So when the 10th of Shvat comes, you'll be able to learn it and, and really know what it says.
Okay. All right. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Thank you. Just uh, let you know this week we're doing um, this week on Tuesday, we're going to make Sufganiyot. If you want to join me in the kitchen Tuesday evening, we're doing Sufganiyot. I, I did say this before, no, that the real miracle of Hanukkah, the real miracle of Hanukkah is that you eat donuts and latkes for eight days and the effects last for 365 days and nights. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Happy Hanukkah, everyone. Thank you. Good night.